Hi, I'm Rich Folley. We're back at the Miami Book Fair 2015. This is Book View Now, and we're joined right now by Scott McCloud, who is the author of a beautiful graphic novel, The Sculptor, which we'll talk about in just a minute. And Cory Doctorow is the co-author of In Real Life. Um, and it's, they're both amazingly wonderful books, very different, as we talked about right before mm -hmm. we went live. But welcome, first of all. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yeah, it's wonderful to have you both. Uh, let's start with you, Scott. The Sculptor, what a uh, labor of love. This is an incredible book. Um, it's a, an amazing graphic novel, and to sort of set the tone a little bit, or just explain a little bit about what it is, mm -hmm. David Smith, the main character in the book, um, has basically, a sculptor, has basically, looking for that creative breakthrough, has sold his soul for 200 days. Well, not his soul, I have to correct you there, okay, because I think, though it is a Faustian yeah, bargain, yeah. this time it's a bargain with death. Yeah. Um, so there's, uh, when, when it's done, it's truly done. He's just dead and gone. Yeah. And, he, and as an artist, he just wanted it that badly, and, and he spent a lot of time, obviously, thinking about this. But there are other things that complicate this as we go further into the book. Yeah. But talk a little bit about this book and how long it took to write it and when the ideas first came to you. Well, the idea for the sculptor came to me when I was just 25 or so. And in a lot of ways, this is a collaboration with me and my much younger self. It's a young man's story in a lot of ways. You know, when we're young, we want to tell big operatic stories. But as we get older, we want to tell stories about smaller moments. So it's a little of both. You know, I wanted to bring out that the young man's enthusiasm and, and craziness and preposterous ambition, but maybe fill in with a little bit of the experience I've had in the intervening years. Yeah, well, there's definitely um, some wisdom in these pages, but it's a long mm -hmm. project, though. Yeah, um, yeah it was. It was five years or so to actually put the thing together. Did you always know that it was, uh, what, did you have an idea of what it was going to look like when you were done, when you started? Did you have an idea of the scope of the project when you began? Yeah, I had a sense of it. Uh, <clears throat> it got longer as everything seems to when I'm, when I'm working on it, everything grows and grows because it gets deeper and deeper, you know? Yeah. You open it up and there's always a box inside the box inside the box, but, but that's fun. That's part of the process of discovery. Yeah, and it doesn't hurt when you have the best graphic novel I've read in years from Neil Gaiman on oh the cover that always helps too. <laughs> Uh, Corey, your book, In Real Life, you, you write a lot of different things. Um, a lot of people know you from Boing, your work with Boing Boing as the editor of Boing Boing. A lot of people know some of, the other, uh, some of your other writing. What brought you to write this, this sort of uh, girl gaming book, uh, graphic novel? Well, you know, it started as a short story called Anda's Game. Uh, I had just moved to the United Kingdom and moved in with a woman who's now my wife. And she, my wife Alice, used to be a professional video game player. She played Quake on the English national team. And I found myself in this milieu surrounded by all these amazing women gamers and game developers and games publishers. And uh, I started to think about a, a story that um, combined some of what I was learning by being around them with some of the things that I thought about in terms of globalism and solidarity and the sense that I had that uh, people I know who were worried about their job security were perceiving their rivals or their, the people who threatened them as people on the other side of the world who were working for lower wages than them and not the people who were sending their jobs away. Yeah. And so I conceived of this idea of a story about solidarity that's found through video games yeah. and about people who f start on opposite sides of the battle lines. Uh, they, they're Chinese workers who work in video games and their uh, uh, Western kids who are paid to go and kill them, they become Pinkertons, to go and kill them in the game to stop them from, from organizing and who find common cause with one another. And I think that's the solidarity story. If you look, read the history of the American labor movement, it really catches fire when uh, they stop allowing you know, poles to be used against Italians and Italians to be used against German workers and they realize that it's, it's workers against bosses and particularly when they start allowing African Americans into the trade unions. And so writing a story about trade unions for kids that set in video games is kind of a weird thing. Yeah. But it worked really well. That story an was- interesting premise to it, get across. It was, yeah. And it was very widely reprinted and I wrote a novel based on it and for a second approached me to, to do a graphic novel and I teamed up with Jen Wang who has the distinct advantages given that the story was set partly in China of being of Chinese background and also given that the story has as its protagonist a woman being a woman and she can write about those things and create those things with a verisimilitude that I can't approach and so I was very lucky to have a collaborator who is not only a brilliant artist and a brilliant storyteller but also situated to make sense of those stories and to find nuances in them that I couldn't have found. Yeah, and that to me, and one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on both together, when you think about the nuance, when you think about the where graphic novel has come, earlier today we had Paul Levitz on, and he talked mm -hmm. about Will Eisner, and, and Scott, you're in that yeah. book. 
Um, but I mean, when you think about that sort of oh, those early pioneering days of, of the graphic novel and where it's come now with some of these storylines that are coming out and the nuanced elements of it and the subcategories and the, and the, and the subgenres that are now growing out of it, there's so much room in this space. And I don't think a lot of people who buy books understand just how big that audience is and how passionate those audiences are. Can you talk about the evolution, I guess, of the of the world you're in? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think that that diversity of genre, diversity of content, diversity of ambition is something that really characterizes graphic novels today and comics in general, because graphic novels, of course, are only a subset of that scene. Um, but this is this is the the biggest takeaway from the last 25, 30 years that I've been in this business is seeing it, seeing it grow to the point where you can no longer keep it all in your field of vision at the same time. That's so important for any art form. We wouldn't want to see the written word reduced to a, just a small collection of genres. We wouldn't want to see movies or animation or music reduced to just a small collection. Finally, comics, uh, the world of comics is so big that you just, you could wander for a year and not see everything. Okay. That's healthy. That's yeah. as it should be. And you know, the tyranny of physical matter is that it can only go <laughs> in one place in a bookstore or one place in a library. And if you read, if you, I used to work in libraries, and if you've ever read through the Dewey Decimal System, which is the kind of thing I used to do for fun, you see that it's a highly idiosyncratic system. Yeah. What, what at maybe a distant remove, if you, you know, if you remember going to the library for the first time as a kid and being shown around by the librarian and said, well, we figured out what category all knowledge goes in. I think when you're six or seven, that's like, oh yeah, of course you've done that. <laughs> and then if you actually go back and you look at it, it's like, there are some major omissions yeah. in this system. And, and what's more, a lot of things transcend the, the, the boundaries. Yeah. And what we have now is, is what we call today hashtags and what we call tags and then fox, foxonomies. And we have, we've had lots of names for it in the last decade. But this idea that things can be in lots of places at once and that audiences can, can uh, cross boundaries as well. Uh, and you don't have to be the kind of person who thinks of yourself as a comic store person right. to find yourself in comics. I mean, it was a huge deal when comics went to bookstores because there were two groups, comic store people and bookstore people. But now the, it's just the internet and the comics and the audiences find each other all over. So to yeah. that point, when do you think or do you think this will ever happen where the word graphic uh, falls away. I mean, the idea of getting information into your brain from uh, one mind to another and mm -hmm. do it in a creative way, whether it's in words or whether it's in pictures or whether it's in a combination, you're seeing so much more of a hybrid now, especially with the young readers. Is there a time when we're not necessarily sticking them in a section that's called graphic novels, that they're just shelved in with everything else? They're just novels they're, or they're stories? Well, we see graphic novels shelved in other sections sometimes. You know, you can find Art Spiegelman's Mouse in Judaica, for yeah. example. But I think it's... List, a bunch of them, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Them. But I think it's appropriate, really. I mean, as Corey was saying, when it's non-tangible, of course, it can be filed in a hundred different categories all at once. But I think it's still appropriate in bookstores sometimes to have a graphic novel section because, well, that may just be what you're looking for, just as the, you may be looking for an audio book, for example. Yeah. But something else you said I think is very important is that is that we're finally beginning to overcome the anxiety of the origin of ideas. Right. You know, ideas, legitimate ideas, legitimate stories, these things, regardless of their origin, regardless of where they come from, even if they come through our eyes, through our ears, through, through written language, or, or through our hands, maybe someday, who knows? If the idea is valid, that's all that should matter. Yeah. And, and I don't think that we should be checking our ideas for, for their identity cards. You know, I think that's, it's, it's a really progressive uh, instinct to, to allow ideas to come from any source at all. And I think it's, it's been the source of a lot of progress over the years. And Absolutely. When I, was a, when I was a bookseller, even then, and I love bookstores, but when I was a bookseller, even then I have to admit that bookstores were not a great place to show up if you wanted a specific book, unless that book was a really recent mm -hmm. release with a certain amount of promotional weight. What bookstores were amazing for is if you didn't know what specific book you were there for. And I think that the future of bookstores regardless of the future of graphic novels, is not to have shelving by category at all. I think the future of bookstores is to be like the best bookstores already. If you go into Word in Brooklyn, if you go into Diesel in Santa Monica, if you go into Secret Headquarters in, in Silver Lake, you're in a store 
that is uh, about finding things you never knew you were looking for. Because mm -hmm. if you know what you're looking for, like getting in the car and driving somewhere to get it is not actually a good use yeah. of your time in most cases. Well, plus, when that, when that works, when that, that theory that you, you know, put forth in a bookstore works, you walk out of that store so thrilled to crack yeah. open that book because it's been this gem, this undiscovered thing, this thing that you're so excited to. You can, bookstores that don't understand that theory, unfortunately when you leave, you buy a book because someone told you to, you go in, you go get that book, right. you leave. But when you find one that's put in front of you because somebody understands mm -hmm. that, it's a wonderful feeling. You yeah, know, in the same way that like, you know, it's so frustrating exactly. to have your kids be drilled in multiplication tables as though your kid will ever <laughs> be better than a spreadsheet at being a spreadsheet, <laughs> yeah. as opposed to arithmetic. And in the same way, it's frustrating to watch the teachers try and turn them into second rate spell checkers as though they'll ever be as good as a real spell checker. Right. It's very frustrating to see bookstores try to be amazing databases, right? right? I want a bookstore to be the place that you, like, I want it to be a shrine and a temple and a, and a, and a celebration not a completist romp through every word ever written. Wow. We don't need that. You and me, you and me both, point. brother. That's yeah. like, uh, those are words to live by right there. Yeah. I would love to keep talking. Both these books are so incredible. And both Thank your you contributions much. to this field and moving it forward and, and cultivating an audience where people can gather um, has been really, really important as well. So Thank Scott, you. thanks for being here. And Corey, really wonderful to have you both. Thank you, Rich. Uh, and